Hello and welcome to My Baking Journey, a podcast for bakers where you get to hear from some of the great minds in the baking industry. My name is Haf. And my name is Rachel. I'm a baker. I know what it's like to be baking all day alone in my kitchen, experiencing the frustrations and struggles with no one else to guide or support me through it. And I'm not a baker, but I've witnessed all the ups and downs that come with this industry and where it's hard to get a little bit of extra help. So if you're looking for advice, tips, and amazing insight from various experienced bakers, you've come to the right place. So let's give you a little insight into what's in store for you this week. I was still working, but to be honest, I just want to leave my job and do this full time. Probably the worst thing that ever happened. And it slid right off the end of the worktop onto the kitchen floor and they all smashed to pieces. Anyone working in this industry, it's long hours. You've got to enjoy what you're doing. Sometimes it's the people that you have got on so well with and you really click with them and you're really happy with what you've made for them. And then you don't hear anything and you think, oh my God, what was wrong with it? You haven't always got to have like a massive goal. Just be happy with what you're doing. Hey everyone. This week, it's back to Northern England to chat with Tracy of Cotton and Crumb. Just two years into running her business, she realized that Not every aspect of running a cake business is exciting. For most of us, it's the decorating or the designing bit, the art that we really enjoy. So she employed her husband to do all the boring bits, baking the cakes, making the buttercream or ganache, cleaning. This then allowed Tracy to focus on what she does best and what she enjoys the most, designing cakes and especially making flowers. Tracy's ability to create flowers for her cakes are some of the best we've seen. Her style is all about elegance with contemporary wedding cake design. You notice I say the word design a lot because you guys are artists. What you design on a cake is nothing short of incredible. It's good to remind yourself of that because you don't just make cakes. You create art that's edible. Tracy's been in this game for a long time now. She has a lot of sound advice to share, especially for wedding cake listeners. So let's jump right in. Enjoy. Tracy, listen, thanks for joining. I have to welcome you to two esteemed clubs that we have from our previous podcast attendees. One of these clubs is being in business for more than a decade, which I think is an amazing credit to you for doing that. And the second interesting one that not many people have actually joined this, and that's having their husband work with them in the business. I'm going to pick your brain on this one later because obviously Rachel and I run a business together. Husband and wife has its interesting moments, doesn't it? We'll get to that later. But before we get to starting your business, going back to as early as 2010, I think we really need to understand you and a bit more about how you are as a person, like what drives you to do this? Is this something where you grew up thinking, I'm always going to have my own business? Or was it somewhere you were inspired by your parents or a sibling or something like that? Okay, no sort of family artistry going on, nothing in my roles at work. It was, I've always loved art and I've always loved flowers. And when I was at school, I actually wanted to be a florist. But back then, it was a little bit more difficult to get into from leaving school. So I never worked in any creative role. I worked for an insurance company for many years. Oh gosh. And back in 2008, when we got married, I really wanted to make some biscuit favours for my own wedding. And I bought Peggy Portion's first book. And as soon as I opened the pages of that, I just knew that's what I wanted to do. I had been to cake shops before and never seen anything feminine and modern. I think back then it was quite old school sort of style of cakes. It wasn't really something I was interested in. And then when I saw that, I thought, wow, that's a bit of me. Did Peggy have her shop open back then? She didn't. No, No. she didn't. This was before the shops in London. She was predominantly a wedding cake maker as well. And she had a few books out. And I, yeah, I made the biscuits for my wedding. And then I started to make other things from the book, the flowers and the mini cakes and cupcakes and things. And it really just went from there, started taking things into work. People really liked what I'd made. And then people would come over that I didn't know at work and ask 
to order a cake from me and pay for it. And that was really the start. And when I look back at those cakes now and shiver, but you've got to start somewhere. <laughs> you've got to start somewhere. I think it's amazing too, because you're sitting here in insurance, right? You're working in insurance and there is no element of, not to, you know, I'm not trying to knock the industry, but from an element of creativity or artistic autonomy to go off and just do crazy things. It's not there, right? I'm amazed yeah, that you a book is what starts it all for you. Well, a drive to to make her own cookies yeah. for her wedding day. I just I actually attended one of Peggy's courses actually on mm-hmm. the cookies. Are you talking about the royal icing ones? And yes, that's yeah, they're it. very delicate, and beautiful, and stunning. But they take a long time. They're not. Oh my goodness, <laughs> they do. I did little suits and little bride's dresses. And when I look back now, I think, no, I, there's no way I could do those now and make any money from them. But at the time it was enjoyable. Like a passion, right? <laughs> Absolutely. I think that's really sparked the passion. And I just, I was still working, but to be honest, I was just looking on the internet at cakes when I should have been working. And I see my boss coming over and I'd quickly flick the screen over. And I knew that I just didn't really want to be there anymore. I just went home one day and said to my husband, Rob, I just want to leave my job and do this full time. And he was like, okay, let's just, he was working full time himself. And he said, let's just see, you know, what you can do. Obviously, you're going to have to get some wedding cake orders in. You can't really have a full time job based on birthday cakes as such. Back then, I don't think you could so much. And I just took the plunge and did the national wedding show display some of my cakes and I got enough orders and then I went in on the Monday and handed my notice in. How long was that before you started your cookies for your wedding and then from the time you actually quit? That was two years of trying to build a business up in the background whilst I was working. Okay. Just really started taking interest in their rate. It's amazing. It's not an overnight thing, is it? It's this is a No, I think that's the trouble. Sometimes people think it is just a quick get into it and off you go. But it's not. There's a lot of things to learn. And even when I really started in 2010, the first two years, I made so many mistakes and learned so many lessons. Still are now, actually, but that's another thing. Give us some examples from back then. we would be interested to hear. Taking on far too much work. I remember my first proper wedding order was 100 mini cakes. And I charged £3.50 per mini cake and did not realise how much work it was. I worked right through the night, went and delivered that order, come back and went straight onto my website and changed the prices. When you're talking about mini cakes, you're not talking about mini cupcakes, you're actually talking about... No, no, all mini cakes. £3.50. Yeah. That's a bargain. (laughs) Well, yeah, obviously the couple that ordered them thought so as well, because they must have been thinking, oh, nice one. You know, even 13 years ago, that was peanuts. You have to do these things and realise the work involved to work out that was not a good idea. Were you doing that for the experience? Yeah, I think so. Well, I just didn't realise how long it would take to make a hundred of them. And that was before sharp edges and ganache. So it was a slightly quicker process, but it just took absolutely forever. And I remember my husband coming down in the morning. I was still sat at the table working where he'd left me when he went to bed. And he was like, oh, have you been here all night? Yep. Oh my still God. Finishing them now. So how did you train yourself up? Because I'm thinking back in... 2010, there wasn't that kind of access to YouTube or no. the same kind of tutorials. It, it was very much book related. That's um, it. There was literally nothing. There was maybe a couple of things on YouTube that I picked up, but I just really started to teach myself right from the beginning. And I, I think I just absolutely love flowers so much. It's always been there. And so I would just look at flowers and try and work out how to make them and It's served me well, really, over the last 13 years of being able to try and work out flowers myself and then being able to make them and to teach them to other people as well. That must have been quite a journey because, you know, these flowers are nothing short of incredible. When you see a photo, if you're just scrolling through, you can easily just mistake them for a real picture, right? Oh, thank you so much. So you decide to take this on, but like anything, this is not something you just pick up. I mean, the art of sugar flowers and Mm -hmm. such a skill, takes time, takes effort. I'm sure you're going to tell us about many incidents where these things just fell apart or just didn't look right. (laughs) Oh, yes. I remember probably the worst thing that ever happened was 
I had been teaching for about a year on and off and I'd made all these flowers in class and I was going to use them on some wedding cakes for the following year. And I had them all in this big box and I put them on the worktop surface and my husband just pushed the box a little bit and it slid right off (gasps) the end of the worktop onto the kitchen floor and they all smashed to pieces. So he looks like I was going to murder him. He, yeah. His face, he went white and he was like, oh my God, I'm so sorry. It was just an accident, but I literally could have cried. Yeah. Had you hired him at this point? <laughs> no, no, this was before. So he hadn't even really taken much notice of how long things took me to make. So yeah, he was horrified and I was beside myself. These things happen, but yeah, there's been many a thing. I've been driving to a venue where a flower's literally just popped off a cocktail stick and smashed in the box. And I had another incident, it was probably about three years ago, I think it was just before COVID actually, where I went to set a wedding cake up and I had the top tier with the flowers on it already in the box. And when I put the box on the table that the cake was being set up, the table collapsed. <gasps> Oh, no. Yeah, so the box went flying, the flowers all smashed on it, and the venue were just horrified. There was a catch underneath the table that had broken. Oh, I yeah. hate those temporary tables. Yeah, they no, always they, freak me out. Yeah, those sort of trestle tables that they yeah. do, like hook together or whatever. I don't know what they do with them. Don't if get me you don't push the legs table. farther enough to the side, the table well, just what, gets all... What do you do, Tracy? Like, how... Literally, God must have been looking down on me that day because I had spare flowers in my car, which I don't usually have time to make but I managed to repair it as best I can it wasn't great but the bride's dad was there and she saw he saw what happened so I knew that no one would be blaming me but I was just so upset that it didn't look how it should but the bride and groom were very happy with it so that was the main thing yeah I can imagine so if you started in 2010 I think you said something like 2012 you hired your husband Mm -hmm. on yeah. So that's quite a quick progression to taking somebody on in the business, I think, from someone who's self-employed doing this. Because a lot of bakers that we've sp- spoken to, they've been going for almost as long as you, still haven't hired anyone. Yeah. And I think it would be really important to shed some light on what that first person that you bring on, whether it's your husband or someone totally different, which is what, that, what the impact that does for you and your business yeah. that you maybe didn't quite realize or maybe you said to yourself I should have done this sooner because I think a lot of people will be on the fence right now thinking about this. Yeah absolutely those first two years of working on my own were very lonely very long hours lots of all-nighters and I got to the point where I thought I did think about taking someone else on and it just so happened that my husband had a slip disc in his back and He was working as a lorry driver at the time and he said, look, I don't think I'm going to be able to go back to that kind of work. Why don't, he actually suggested it to me, why don't we work together and see how it goes? And my first thought was, okay, let me just think about all the things I don't enjoy. (laughs) (laughs) So yeah, I made him a list and that would include, I don't mind baking, but it's not my favourite part of the job. So I thought, well, he could do that. And he can do all the tax paperwork and, yeah, just pretty much all the naff things <laughs> that come the non, along non with Non-creative stuff, right? <laughs> yeah, that's Brilliant. it, absolutely, because he's not creative at all. But, it, yeah, so to begin with, when we first started, I don't even actually remember it being that difficult. I think it depends on who that person is. For, for me, Rob is very easy to work with. He's a hard worker. I don't have to tell him to do anything. I just literally give him a list of everything he needs to do that week. And we've got our own separate roles. So I think because we don't overlap too much in the business, it's fine working together. Don't get me wrong, there's occasions where we probably want to murder each other a little (laughs) bit because he can feel my eyes bearing into his back, I think, sometimes when he's doing things because I'll question why are you doing it like that? Or that's not quite right. I, and sure, of course, if he sees a tray of sugar flowers, he's not going anywhere near yeah, it. Yeah, well, that's right. it. Yeah, he's uh, very careful from now on. And keen to understand how, did that enable you to take on more work or did it enable you to have a bit of a balance? A little bit of both. I think it allowed us to take a little bit more work on, not double the amount of work because I was just working so many hours on my own that, 
it just wasn't working. Our son at the time was, he was young. And when my husband was at work and I was running the business, like any person will tell you, working from home and the other person doesn't, you're sort of left with looking after your kids and trying to run a business. So you're kind of doing two roles. And, you know, so you sort of work quite late at night, into the night, through the night. And that's not good for anybody. Although we do a little bit more work, not double the amount, one person to two person. I think the overlap piece is the interesting bit, Rachel, because it also works for us running our business because I'm doing operations, finances, inventory, Mm -hmm. all the tech stuff on the website I like doing, which is great. She's the creative one, helping with product design, doing marketing, content creation, obviously all the baking that we put into our content is all done by her. And I don't get involved in that as much. So this lack of overlap certainly allows us to get on with our and focus without having to butt heads around, oh, we should do this way or this way or that way. I think there's bigger strategy questions, right? Where do you want to take the business? Obviously, we are both heavily involved in, but aside from it, from a day-to-day perspective where things can probably get annoying or distracting or things like that, you stay away from each other. I think that's what really helps in that regard. And because you've offloaded all these things that you just didn't like doing, I'm sure you all of a sudden running your own business became a lot better now because you're just purely focusing on the things you really like to do. Absolutely. Anyone working in this industry, it's long hours. You've got to enjoy what you're doing. Yeah, I feel very lucky that I have my husband to do all the parts that I don't particularly enjoy. I would probably say I still maybe work longer hours than he does because my parts are more time consuming than his are. But no, I just feel really grateful that we are able to work together and we do get on very well. And because we don't overlap much, it just works for us. It can definitely help on the childcare piece because I I think a lot of mums or parents will and dads will really relate to this because it it is a struggle when you're working from home. It is that default. I'm just thinking about also for us, two weeks ago, my son came down with strep A and, and half was away. And I wasn't very well, but and there's still the business still needs to run and do stuff. A lot of things just have to fall or wait. And I'm just wondering from your perspective, you've got a wedding cake booked in for the weekend and you've probably done a lot of prep beforehand on the flowers, the sugar flowers, because they're very time consuming or wafer paper flowers. But have you had scenarios where the unexpected has happened, right? It's been a child that's got sick or you've got sick. Let's not underestimate that, right? You can't deliver when you're ill, that you might have COVID or stuck in bed or some flu or something happens externally. And how do you manage that scenario? Because when you are an individual baker, even if you've got your husband helping with a lot of the operation side of it, it still comes down to you and delivering that. It does. It's so difficult. One of the most difficult parts isn't it you can't just phone in sick which (laughs) you'd like to sometimes I remember when my son was younger when he was five he was diagnosed with type 1 diabetes and he had to go into hospital and obviously we both wanted to be there for him but I had a wedding cake the following day and I just remember having to come home from the hospital leave him there and just make this cake for somebody and It was just so difficult. It emotionally just felt so terrible about it all, but just couldn't let someone down on their wedding day either. I think it's really tough sometimes. And I think it's important for bakers like ourselves to have a good network of other cake makers that you could perhaps fall back on if you desperately needed to. I've touched word in 13 years. I've not had to ever cancel anyone's wedding cake thank God. But I have really been through hell and back to actually get someone's cake done when I've, my dad passed away and I had to do some work. And like I say, with my son being ill, I think everyone faces these things. And if you really can't do it with COVID or something like that, then it's important to have a few friends that are at the same level as you are to help you out and vice versa. Then this is interesting. So I'm going to talk about a couple of interesting ups in your business here, because <laughs> from our research, we've got here in 2011, you won Best Cake Designer at the West Midlands and Wedding Industry, which... That's right. Was that your first award? It was, Okay, yeah. so this is a year into the business. 
You've been nominated for award. You win the award. And how does that make you feel? Well, yeah. I mean, I just couldn't believe it at the time. I was just blown away. I think shocked. Obviously, very happy. Did a customer nominate you? Or I mean, how did this come about? Well, it was the Wedding Industry Awards. It was when it first started. You can just nominate yourself, but then your customers have to vote for you. I think the format has changed quite a lot since I first entered. To be honest, I'm not big on these awards things, if I'm honest. I think a lot of them are money making. I know that might sound controversial, but now you've got to pay to enter. You've got to pay to go to the regional award. Oh, I see. To go to the national award. I just think it just takes away from what it really should be. So I don't enter them yeah. anymore. It's not for me, but that's just personally what I, how I feel. understand. Was that one of your milestones that sort of helped propel the business another step, would you say, though? Or did other things happen during the early years where... I don't know if winning awards gets you lots of orders. I think for me, I'm not a good salesperson. For me, I like the cakes to really do the selling themselves. Which they do. <laughs> yeah, they definitely do that. <laughs> Thank there's, no, you. there's no question there. I just rely on that, I think, because like I say, I'm just not very good at selling myself or selling the cakes. I know that sounds crazy, but I'm just not. I've never been like that. But you are, when we were researching this chat, you are everywhere. Wedding blogs, articles, magazines. Literally, I can put up your name or and you just spring up everywhere. Is that something that they picked up from your social media, from your website, from your clients? Yeah, I think so. I think we seem to appear on Pinterest quite a lot. I don't know if that helps, yeah. but <laughs> yes, yeah, certainly social media. I think we've got a large following on Facebook and Instagram when it was easy to grow a mm. following on those pages. Not so easy now. So I, yeah, I think maybe it's just come from those. I don't really know, to be honest. I think I'm just really grateful that people do share our work and around. <laughs> we get around. You yeah. say you're not a good salesperson in that sense, but there's certainly some things you've done right because probably one of the hardest topics the uh, bakers who work for themselves struggle with is obviously pricing. My experience of the wedding industry, I'll be honest with you, Tracy, is very limited. I don't know that much. So I'm really, <laughs> this is why I'm getting so much out of this conversation. But one thing I noticed you do that I don't even see a lot of bakers who don't even cover weddings, they don't even do this, is publish their pricing on their website. Yeah. And you've got that up front and you're very firm with that. And obviously at this point in your career and your business, you can command a certain rate. We don't have to say the explicit rates, but I think what's really important here is that you do that. And I'm wondering if this goes... You said when you did the mini cakes for £3.50, <laughs> you went back on your website and you changed the pricing. So I'm assuming this yeah. is something you've done from day one on your website. Yeah, it is. I think I went through a stage to begin with where I didn't have a lot of pricing on there. And what was happening is I was getting a customer that would send me seven or eight different pictures of my cakes and saying, how much would this be and that be? And you would spend so long typing out prices that... And then you never hear from them again, which I'm sure everyone can agree that happens a lot. Yeah, so I just thought it's easier to be transparent. And I think as well, from a customer's point of view, it's before they contact you, and I would be the same if I was looking for something, I'd want to get a rough idea of how much I was paying for before contacting the person. So it just gets rid of time wasting. It gets rid of people that perhaps our cakes aren't within their budget, that kind of thing. So it, it just saves the customer and it saves us you know so it's just it's there for them and they know roughly what they're going to be paying and you didn't have to base this on let's say what other wedding cake makers are doing in your area or anything like this this is really more of your principles mm -hmm. around looking at your costs your time yeah. your value and setting a price based on that is that the approach you took Absolutely, absolutely. I don't think it's worth comparing yourself to other companies in the area. Everyone's going to have their own pricing strategies. For us, I've always wanted people to come to us for our cakes and our cakes only, you know, not to say, oh, we're on a really tight budget, so we've come to you, that kind of thing. For, at the end of the day, this is me and my husband's full income. We have to make a decent amount of profit. Not so easy again now in the current climate, but I've never really compared our business to any others. I think for us, it's just we try and charge not extortionate prices, but I try and charge what I feel our work is worth. And like I say, lots of people 
pay it. So for us, that's a happy medium. We want people to come to us for our cakes, but we still want them to be able to afford them. Not everybody, not everyone's going to be able to afford everything. But you would be surprised how many times we give a quote to people and you never, ever hear from them again. Sure. Or the reverse, you give a quote to somebody and they say, yeah, sure, let's go ahead, right? Oh, yeah. Some of them will say, oh, that's really cheap. And you think, oh, damn it. <laughs> oh, darn, I missed the zero. <laughs> Feel free to pay us more if you think it's cheap. <laughs> hey, sorry to interrupt, but I have to ask. You know you're about to go bake a cake, right? Or maybe you're making one right now. A really nice and expensive tall cake with some beautiful decorations and maybe some dried flowers or a large topper. What are you going to box that in when you give that to the customer? Please don't tell me you're going to use extenders and staple that to a standard flimsy box and then wrap the thing in plastic and then give that to the customer hoping for the best. I have a better idea. Why don't you try Olber Tall Cake Boxes? They're gorgeous, strong, they come in 14 or 20 inches tall. You can easily put them together and they're perfect for your beautiful cakes. I mean, you've just spent four or five hours making this thing. Show it off in something that's going to elevate your brand to another level and then wow the customer. Check them out at www.olba.shop. That's O-L-B-A-A. All right, back to the show. I just want to talk about wedding planning in general is so fraught with emotion and the anticipation, the excitement. The wedding cake is going to be one of these key features on the wedding day. Yeah. So how do you manage the wedding couple's expectation of their cake and their budget and style? And have you got better over the years? Yeah, I think I've definitely got better. I think to begin with, I would just be completely doubting myself with everything I did. Are they going to like it? Is it going to be what they expect? But I think confidence breeds confidence. So, you know, if the customers feel you're confident with what you're doing and that you're going to deliver, then, you know, they will feel that. You get such a varied amount of customers that you speak to and that you deal with. Some of them, they just do whatever you like and we're happy with everything you've done. Others will be so particular about what they want. They're bringing in colour sam- paint colour samples and saying, oh, yeah, I want it between that shade and that shade for that rose. And they're the ones that make you feel nervous. And they're messaging you every week, how's my cake coming along two weeks before? Well, it's not. I'm not really awesome. <laughs> yeah. I haven't made it yet. <laughs> Unless you want something that's stale. Can I have a photo of my cake before you... No, because if you don't like it, it's tough. We're not going to be changing it the day before the wedding. And some people are just so intense with it. And it's just trying to keep them calm and to just say, look, your cake's going to be amazing. You're going to love it. Not, oh, I hope you like it kind of thing. You've got to just try and wing it with some customers, shall we say. And I'm sure that you've got better at that over the years because I can imagine like those first couple of wedding cakes, you're just like, oh, I hope they're going to like it. Probably quite a few wedding cakes, right? As you get used to different customers. But I just think that's also got to be factored in as time, right? Time going back into to the customer. Yeah, sometimes I feel like I've earned the £100 deposit before they've even paid it. <laughs> I imagine. And then they don't pay it and you think, well, that was like four hours of work. I'm never going to get back again. Yeah, it is. It's really hard sometimes because like you say, you do just, there's so much correspondence, phone calls, meetings. You feel like you've really earned it before you've charged anything. And how important has feedback on the cake been for you post the wedding event? Yeah, this is a difficult one. This is one I struggle with actually, even now. I think, again, there's just that tiny bit of lack of confidence and I don't really portray it online or anything. But I think when you don't hear from customers and you don't hear from all of them, you think, oh my God, they didn't like it. That's your initial thought. They didn't like it. They hated it. They didn't enjoy the cake. And my husband always says to me, no news is good news. If somebody didn't like what you'd made, they would be very quick to contact you. So you don't need to worry about those kind of things. But I think you just, you care so much about and you want them to be happy with it. And I know they've paid for it. They don't have to give you feedback, but you just really want that sort of self-doubt put to bed that they enjoyed their cake and they were happy with everything you've made and sometimes you just don't get that and I know some people will contact their customers afterwards and say just asking for some feedback I think I'm just too scared to do that and that's so interesting because what you're 
13 years into the business now yeah. and still like that fear exists. I remember also personally for me, I, I didn't dabble into wedding cakes. I think I did one, one <laughs> small one once. But I, I just even remember with birthday cakes, I delivered them. And I'd be like, oh, I hope that flavor cake was nice. I hope they liked it. It's a lot of stress. Yeah, <laughs> yeah I get I, a lot of this. You think they like it? You I think they'll they like it? I hope they put it in the fridge. I hope they stored it. Like, you've got it there. <laughs> Walk away. No, you've done your job. I know. It's terrible. It is. And I'll lay there at night thinking I didn't. And it, sometimes it's the, it's the people that you have got on so well with and you've really clicked with them and you're really happy with what you've made for them. And then you don't hear anything and you think, oh my God, what was wrong with it? But like I say, I think if there was an issue, somebody would let you know. Now tell me, being in the wedding cake business, as many people know who are bakers, 2020 was just a shocking year because of how all of a sudden your industry could just be turned off Mm -hmm. in an instant. And there's probably a lot of things you've now learned going through that process in terms of whether or not you needed to pivot, shut the business, do something else, go back to insurance. I'm sure everything went through your mind. Yeah. So can you just shed some light on that time, March 2020, what what was happening? Because we've heard about this a little bit from a previous guest and a friend of yours, Carly, Wish Upon a Cupcake. Yeah. We got an interesting take from her. And it'd be really interesting to get your take on this because this is solely what you do. Yeah, it was such a difficult and scary time for everybody. I tried to stay positive thinking, look, no no one I knew got really ill from it. And that's obviously the main thing. But it was so stressful having customers wanting deposits back, changing dates without telling you. And there would be dates you couldn't do. And then it was just horrible. It was really horrible. From a financial point of view, obviously, income was just completely cut off straight away. But we were the lucky ones because we're a limited company. We was allowed to furlough ourselves when we needed to. And it wasn't a huge amount of money. We had to freeze our mortgage for over a year. We had to live off a very small amount of money. Although we was furloughed, if we wanted to work, we would just have to give the hours that we'd worked. We did start to make treat boxes, birthday cakes, things like that. For the money, but also just to keep doing something because to go from working sort of 50, 60 hours a week to nothing mentally was not... I actually really enjoyed making some different types of cakes that I would normally do. There was a bit more creativity in doing different birthday cake styles. One thing probably don't miss now from all of that is customers just turning up whenever the hell they wanted to pick a cake up. What's that all about? (laughs) We usually just deliver the cake to a wedding venue and that's it. But people, oh, you pick it up at 10, you know, three hours later, you're still waiting for them to come and pick it up. Like you've got nothing else to do. But yeah. It's a challenge. It's a challenge. And I think actually it's quite, it shows that in the way that works with the wedding in the cake industry, about the whole delivery process and the structure. And it's, it's a project. It's a massive project. And you treat it as such. And you deliver to it as such. It seems to have milestones. It seems to have delivery targets. So there's all these things you can apply to these corporate project delivery things that happen. You seem to be able to apply to delivering a wedding cake as well. Yeah, definitely. So on that topic of delivering a wedding cake, I'm quite interested. In this. Obviously, we're in the packaging business. So we're, we're used to delivering a lot smaller cakes than what you make. But How do you go about it? Do you do this all in one piece? Do you do it in pieces? Do you assemble at the site? Walk us through a a standard delivery. Okay, so most of our cakes are maybe between three tiers, four tiers and five tiers. So we don't transport them all together. We get asked this a lot because what happens is when I finish the cake, I like to stack it at home in the kitchen, photograph it and then take it back apart. And people will just see the full thing in my kitchen and say, have you taken that all in one piece? No, is the answer, because they're just far too heavy, just doesn't feel safe enough to be transporting a four or five tier cake and just literally wouldn't be able to carry it anyway. It'd be far too heavy. Mm, So that's what I do, because I like to have all my photographs similar. You can't rely on venues for photos sometimes, hideous backdrops and wonky tables and an iron tablecloths, the list goes on. The cakes will be transported, usually just two tiers stuck together, 
the bottom two, and then the other tiers will be in separate boxes. The flowers will mainly be on the cake where I arranged them originally, but I always put pieces of kitchen towel between the flowers, wrap some cling film around the entire cake just to keep everything packed in. When you're transporting cakes, oh my God, our roads are just hideous. They're absolutely horrendous. Is that also so you don't want the sugar flowers to fall off? So at least if they've got the clink around it. That's it. It's not so much the falling off. They do tend to stay on the cake, but it's just if you're going over speed bumps or potholes, you get that sort of vibration in your car. The flowers will start like clanking together and petals can start breaking because they're so fragile. So I find if you put kitchen towel between them and then wrap the whole thing in cling film, so it just keeps them staying put. And do you do the photography at your house? Yeah, I do. I photograph, the, I use a camera. I don't, as, as great as the iPhones are, the angles of the cakes won't be quite right. So a camera, some natural light on one side of the kitchen, just a plain-ish backdrop. And yeah, that's what I do. Take loads and loads of photos and then... That's a, that's a really good way to do it because then you don't, you, that's it. That's done. You've got mm-hmm. your content. You've got your portfolio work out the way. Now you can transport the way you need, you know best and yeah. then assemble. You don't have to worry about getting any pictures over there at the venue or anything No, like that. that's it. Because like I say, at venues, some of them are really dark. Some of them are poorly lit. Some of them have got things in the background of the cake, like fire extinguishers, ugly switches on the walls and all sorts. Yeah, I'm not really painting a great picture of the venues, but... <laughs> well, you never know. Have you ever had when you're doing the setup? First of all, I can see visually how that makes sense. So it makes also easy for you when you get uh, the venue to go, yeah, I know exactly how to set this cake up and where to align it and those lines. But has anything ever broken or you suddenly realized that I've missed a piece or I've missed it? It's supposed to be, it's five tiers, but I've only got four. <laughs> <laughs> like that at the time. Such would have never left a tier at home. I have left the favors back at home that I've had to come back and get like biscuit favours and things yeah no I, I don't think I have I think oh no I'll tell you what there was once where I'd, a cake stand, cake had a little cake stand between the tiers and I hadn't got that so I had to phone my husband and he had to sit in traffic on the M6 to come and bring it and, oh god <laughs> yeah literally cursing me all the way I'd imagine for things like that but to be honest yeah I sound really organised now don't I the, yeah <laughs> absolutely <laughs> You've got more than a decade into the window into this, really. How have you seen weddings change when it comes to cakes, if anything? I think what will always be the same is people like pretty cakes, pretty feminine cakes, floral cakes, things like that. But I've certainly seen a lot more people, for us, asking for buttercream cakes, naked cakes, semi-naked cakes coated in buttercream or ganache. But I just don't feel comfortable doing them. The two reasons, I think the heat in this country now in the summer is can be quite severe. Um, I don't know if I could just deal with the stress of that. And for me, and this is not against anybody that makes those styles of cakes, but if you're just doing a buttercream cake, there's not a huge amount you can do on it design-wise. You know, you can add gold leaf and fresh flowers and things like that. But for me, I just need more out of the designs. I, I just prefer to have a lot more creativity with the cake. And I think when you've got fondant on there, you know, you can really go to town with the design of the cake. But yeah, I have seen a lot, a, a big sort of shift in, in people wanting more rustic style cakes. What about things like groom's cakes or things like that? Do you see more requests for that as well? Or is that... Just... No, I don't think I've ever been asked for a groom's cake. Did I have a groom's cake? I can't remember if I had a groom's cake at our wedding. I don't think we did. We just had the one cake, right? Yeah. That's right. <laughs> I think occasionally you hear about it's it. like an American thing, mainly. Yeah, but perhaps, perhaps. Very cool. Interesting. All right. So, listen, really great insight into being a wedding cake maker. This is fantastic stuff. Thank you for that. We like to wrap up with a little quick fire round, a few questions to ask you. First thing that comes to mind, you don't have to explain it if you don't want to. So, I'm going to go first. And uh, I need to modify this question a little bit to cater for your cakes, possibly. American buttercream, Swiss meringue buttercream, ganache or fondant? Okay, so a mixture of all of them. So fondant for the outside of the cake, ganache for the layer before the fondant, Swiss meringue buttercream for 
cupcakes and American buttercream for the fillings of wedding cakes. Although our American buttercream is the same ratio of icing sugar to butter. A lot of people use double the amount a lot, of sugar. Yeah. I find ah. it really sickly, really sweet. So yeah, we don't really make that style. That's interesting. I don't think anyone's ever answered all four. <laughs> I know. Right. That's amazing. That's very cool. <laughs> One aspect of bacon you won't compromise on. Oh my goodness. Well, obviously ingredients, but the main ingredient I will not compromise on is the flour. I think a really good, we use the McDougal Supreme cake flour. And when you use others, it's just not the same. So oh, my, wow. we couldn't Quite get cute. a plain one. We couldn't get the other day. My husband said, I'm just going to get the regular one. I went, no, you're going to have to go around all the supermarkets and get the correct one. There's no way we're, we're using that. Interesting. Very cool. Okay. How about a baking book from your bookshelf? Oh, well, I've literally just bought the Crumbs and Doilies baking book. Literally got it yesterday, had a flick through, looks really interesting. Interesting that they use oil and butter in their vanilla cake. So I think that's worth investigating. There's lots of things in there like brownies and cookies. My son just absolutely adores things like that. He's not a cake person at all. So They get a bit immune to it when it's around the house oh, all yeah. the time. Yeah, <laughs> I think literally sick of the sight of it i think yeah. he's just he's grown, grown up around it and he's just he's just no not having yeah, it I'll just have some haribos or something exactly We're trying to get like, our oh, five-year-old son to eat a lovely italian macaron that rachel's made and she's like, eh. yeah he's, no just reach just give me a crispy cream donut yeah, yeah exactly, exactly. <laughs> who would you like to make your next birthday cake i have to say carly from wish upon a cook She's a really good friend. Her cakes are lovely. I'd like her to make me one of those number ones with all the little donuts and the little bits and pieces on. But obviously I'd need one like double figures. (laughs) Well, (laughs) Carly, if you're listening, you're up to the side. (laughs) You've been recruited. I've been busy for a while having to make large numbers. I know we didn't get a chance to touch on it, but I know just quickly, how important has teaching been for you and giving back to this uh, community? baking community. Yeah, it's been amazing. Amazing. I just, there's no better feeling than teaching someone and seeing them to go on and just have such a successful business. I taught a lot of top cake designers over the last 10 years and yeah, just seeing how they've developed and it's just been, it's really rewarding. I just really enjoy that side of it as well because one, I have got a separate teaching space so I'm me and my husband don't do that together. That's just something that I do. And I get people come from all over the world to learn the sugar craft. And it's just such a massive compliment. And you also go all around the world to teach it as well. So yeah, I've been all, I've been to Australia, America, lots of places in Europe. It's, I've just loved it. I've loved the people I've met and just experiencing the way other people work with cakes. It's an eye opener. Can we expect to see more of this? Is there an expansion plan for cotton and crumbs? Or? <laughs> I don't know. I think I'm always open to offers of teaching abroad. I just put that out there. But in terms of opening a school, or uh, it's not for me. <laughs> for where we live, overheads are just absolutely impossible to have a unit or something like that to, to expand and grow the business. I'm just really happy with what I'm doing. I like working from home. I like working with my family. And it just works for us. I think you haven't always got to have a massive goal. Just be happy with what you're doing. Yeah, and just see where that takes you, right? Yeah. <laughs> Sound advice. Sound advice, Tracy. Thank you so much. Honestly, really enjoyed that. Really informative, especially on the wedding aspect of things. I learned a lot, so really appreciate and it. So inspiring as well, Tracy. So, so, so inspiring. Your cakes are works of art. They're absolutely beautiful. So it's so nice to actually sit down and have a chat with you and hear about your journey. And you're such a lovely person as well. (laughs) That's really kind. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me onto your podcast. And that wraps up episode 12 of My Baking Journey from your friendly hosts, Rachel and Half. We're back next week. But uh, before we get to that, please, if you're enjoying this podcast, don't forget to rate us like us, leave a review if you're feeling generous even. And of course, if you follow or subscribe to us in your favorite podcast app, you will be updated as soon as the next episode comes back. So if you want to know more about Tracy, all the information is in the show notes, including some of her tutorials on how she makes her flowers. And we will see you next week. 
This podcast is brought to you by Olba, packaging for bakers, designed by a baker. Find out more at www.olba.shop. Bye-bye.